join. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our next session of NU at Noon. Um, so I'm just going to uh, remind everyone today that we are recording this presentation. Um, so that you can watch it in the future um, and for also for attendees who weren't able to attend. Um, so just know that you are being recorded. Um, I also just wanna remind folks to please remember to keep your um, computer or phones muted throughout the presentation. Um, we will be doing question and answers at the end of the presentation. So if you do have a question, um, feel free to put it into the general chat box or you can message it directly to me um, and we'll go through all the questions at the end. Um, and though I know everyone has enjoyed my introductions the past two weeks, Weeks. I'm going to turn it back over to Joe Hunt to introduce our presenter for today. So Joe, I'll let you take it away. Okay, thank you and welcome everyone. Steve Locke, a well-known artist and educator in the Boston area, once told me that, quote, every work of art generates multiple truths, all of which are equally valid. Every work of art generates multiple truths, all of which are equally valid. I believe this is true because each viewer sees that truth offered by the artwork, which reflects their personality, background, social and cultural environment, and so on. Normally, these multiple truths are not a concern for artworks privately displayed. However, when artwork, such as statues, are openly displayed for viewing by the public, some viewers may see truths indicating a particular statue is inappropriate, unsettling, or even offensive. When disputes do arise concerning a specific statue, several difficult questions arise such as, who determines if the objections are worthy of merit? What criteria do they use? Further, who determines what action is appropriate if the objections are found to have merit? We're pleased to have with us today someone who can provide us with some valuable background and insight into issues of this type, namely Professor Patricia Davis. She is a critical cultural studies scholar whose research and teaching concern public memory, identity, race, gender, and representation. Her recent book, Laying Claim, African American Cultural Memory and Southern Identity, published by the University of Alabama Press in 2016, won the Best Book Award from the American Studies Division of the National Communications Association in 2017, and from the Critical Cultural Studies Division of the National Communications Study Association in 2018. Her essays have appeared in numerous journals and edited editions. She has taught courses on public memory, media ethics, race and gender in the media and popular culture, and communications in diversity. Currently, she is an associate professor right here at Northeastern University in our College of Arts, Media, and Design. So with a warm Northeastern at noon welcome, I now turn this session over to our presenter, Patricia Davis. Thank you very much. I'll just tell you a little bit about my background. I grew up in Virginia and prior to coming to Northeastern in 2019, worked at the University of North Carolina and Georgia State University. I have spent most of my life in different parts of the South, in small towns, a college town, and a large city, and have always been intellectually fascinated by the enduring, obs enduring obsession with Civil War history, particularly the ways it continues to affect or infect, however you choose to see it, our contemporary politics and culture on a national scale. In my hometown in Virginia, there's a Confederate monument in the town square. There was one on the campus of UNC until it was removed by protesters in 2018. And there's one less than a mile from my house in Atlanta. The nicest thing I can say about these monuments is that they present a one-sided version of Civil War history. 
In my work, I present detailed analyses of African Americans' efforts to bring to light their own memories of the era and create a counter narrative to the false histories perpetuated by white amateur and professional historians over the last 150 years. My first book, Laying Claim, details some of these efforts. Let me begin by telling the story of a chair. One of the most recent and intriguing events in the ongoing battles over Confederate monuments took place just a few weeks ago. It concerns this monument pictured here. This is a carved stone chair that was presented to the city of Selma, Alabama in 1893 to honor the memory of former Confederate President Jefferson Davis, who had visited the city 20 years earlier. It was paid for and dedicated by the United Daughters of the Confederacy, the UDC. Many of you may have heard of it, which is the organization responsible for having erected some 700 Confederate monuments all over the country and is still active today. Since its dedication, the monument has stood in the historic old Live Oak Cemetery in the city. On March 19th of this year, sometime between midnight and 3 a.m., the chair disappeared. Itself, White Lies Matter sent a series of emails to the news organization AL.com claiming responsibility for having stolen it and demanding a ransom from the UDC in exchange for its return. Their demand, that the Richmond, Virginia headquarters hang a large banner from their building for 24 hours by 1 p.m. on April 9th, the anniversary of the Confederacy surrender. The banner, which the group sent to the UDC, contains the following quote from Black Liberation Army activist Asada Shakur, who fled to Cuba after escaping prison in 1979. Quote, the rulers of this country have always considered their property more important than our lives. The group further explained its motivation. America's original sin is that people were kidnapped from their homes and forced to build one of the most prosperous nations in the world without being allowed to participate in it. We decided in the spirit of such ignominious traditions to kidnap a chair instead. Jefferson Davis doesn't need it anymore. He's long dead. To be honest, he never even had the chance to sit in it in the first place. Like most Confederate monuments, it continued um, it continued, the chair mostly exists to remind those whose freedom had to be purchased in blood that there still exists a portion of our country that is more than willing to continue to spill blood to avoid paying that debt down. We took their toy and we don't feel guilty about it. They never play with it anyway. They just want it there to remind us what they've done, what they are still willing to do. But the South won't rise again, not as the Confederacy because that coalition left out a large portion of its population. All that's left of that nightmare is an obscenely heavy chair that's a throne for a ghost whose greatest accomplishment was treason. Okay, the group then explained the consequences of the UDC's refusal to display the banner. Failure to meet the demand will result in the monument an ornate stone chair immediately being turned into a toilet. If the UDC does not display the banner, not only, I'm sorry, if the UDC does display the banner, not only will we return the chair intact, but we will clean it to boot. See enclosed photograph, the group said, with the Photoshop image on the right, as you can see there. When interviewed shortly thereafter, a UDC spokeswoman simply said, fake news, a dog whistle that has become a signal of tribal loyalty in contemporary white right-wing politics. In a separate later interview, the UDC member who reported the theft expressed anger over the extortion attempt and accused groups like White Lives Matter of trying to dictate history, declining to say whether or not she believed the fact that the Civil War was fought over slavery she stated that she was offended by those who are trying to rewrite history and impose their own ideas and their own opinions about days gone by. And that's a direct quote from what she said. This tale provides a great illustration of the connections among memory, social identity, and the removal of Confederate monuments. 
These relationships are the topic of my talk today. I'll begin by providing some background information, specifically the rhetorical function of monuments, the difference between history and memory, and some historical context for the erection of Confederate monuments. I'll then discuss four functions that these structures perform with attention to the ways in which they shape social identities, which includes racial identity. I'll then discuss my perspective on why their removal has become part of the Black Lives Matter movement and the racial reckoning it has spurred. Throughout this discussion, I'll talk about how African-American-centered memories present modes of resistance to the messages conveyed through Confederate monuments. I'll start by discussing the function of monuments as memorial structures. First, it is important to distinguish between history and memory. History is conceived of as a set of objective facts about what happened, when it happened, and why it happened. It focuses on people, places, dates, and events. While history is largely based on provable facts, it is not 100% objective, although most people conceive of it that way. The reliance on professional historians on documented sources contained in archives means that our historical knowledge is incomplete, only a partial record with many absences. Furthermore, the historical data that make it into records are subject to differing interpretations with something as simple as a word or phrase, emphasis or de-emphasis affecting the way a particular historical event may be read. Political battles over school history textbooks is one example that illustrates this point. Nevertheless, generally speaking, history is relatively neutral in its primary reliance on objective facts. Memory, on the other hand, is based in history, but it's much more overtly socially constructed. In other words, it relies less on what happened than what is said to have happened. Memories are made from our interpretations of historical events, including our perspectives on their meanings in the present and their impact on the future. It is comprised of historical narratives and myths that are useful at particular points in time and for specific ends. Memories are passed down over generations through a variety of forms that include, but also lie outside of official sources of history. Examples of these include monuments, historical performances, film, museums, and many other sources through which most people attain their historical knowledge. All of these features mean that memories are the products of negotiation and those that become official or dominant memories are those that favor whatever group is in power at a particular point in time. Because of the relationship of memory to power, monuments operate to elevate the preferred memories of dominant groups without regard to historical objectivity or truth. In short, they are not structures that teach us about history, but are rather means of elevating one set of interpretations over others. They serve not to commemorate, but to venerate the events that they, that they memorialize, as well as those who were involved in them. To the extent that a particular monument does teach us about history, it is only the history of the power relations of the era that produced it. With this in mind, it is not difficult to see how Confederate monuments are tied to racial identity and political affiliation, and more importantly, why their removal is part of the racial reckoning that has been continued by the Black Lives Matter movement. Now I'll provide a bit of context about Confederate monuments. Shortly after the Civil War ended, white Southerners were looking for redemption for a war they had lost. They calculated that though they had been defeated in battle, they could win in terms of shaping the memory of the war. As part of this redemption narrative, they reframed the war as having been fought not over slavery, but rather over the desire to defend themselves against a federal government attempting to encroach upon their God-given rights. In this story, Confederate soldiers and generals were not men who fought to keep Black people enslaved, but rather noble, honorable men who fought for the good cause of protecting what they called the Southern way of life. This is all part of what is referred to as the lost cause a mythological rendering of Civil War history and a reference that some of you might be familiar with. Thus began a campaign on the part of multiple groups 
the most prolific of which was the UDC. Over the course of nearly 100 years, they erected monuments to Confederate President Jefferson Davis, Confederate generals such as Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, and Nathan Bedford Forrest, and the nameless soldiers who fought for the lost cause. Over time, they erected thousands of Confederate monuments all over the US. Most of them are located in the South, but there are also some in places such as California, New Jersey, Wisconsin, and other non-Southern states. Here, I speak only about statues to Confederate generals and anonymous soldiers, as well as obelisks. But the numbers are even higher when you include other memorial structures, such as school, building, military base, street, and highway names. Additionally, it is important to note the timing. These monuments were constructed at very specific points in history long after the Civil War had ended. Most were erected during the Jim Crow era when African Americans were relegated to second class citizenship and subject to the cruelties of that system. There were also monuments erected during the decades of the civil rights movement when African American demands for equality posed direct threats to the status quo. Basically, they were erected during times in which the prevailing racial order was being threatened. The message implicated in these monuments was one of resistance to equality. In their writings and during the num numerous dedication ceremonies that were held at the unveiling of the monuments, the objectives in doing so were made clear. These structures were meant to not only honor those who died, but also to educate future generations of children about the desired interpretation of the war, its causes and consequences. This, of course, makes the UDC statement about the stolen chair a bit of projection. Nevertheless, a significant element in these narratives is the notion that slavery was good for Black people, or at least wasn't so bad, and that enslaved persons were treated well, in some cases like family members, and really didn't desire the freedom that white men and women took as their own birthright. So these monuments accomplish a few things, four of which I'll discuss here. So one, they sustain racial hierarchies. Two, they, they revise history in ways that preserves racial identity, I'm sorry, that preserves social identity and social status. Three, they marginalize African-American histories. And four, they obscure the historical context for contemporary inequities. And for the record, the lowercase c in Confederate that you see here was a deliberate choice on my part. Okay, so first, uh, the UDC and those who oppose removing these monuments today were and are right about one thing. They do serve an educational purpose. They were erected as a means of educating everyone of their place in the racial hierarchy. They educate white people in the principles of white supremacy and in venerating those who fought to keep them enslaved, the structures send the message to black people that their own historical experiences do not matter and serve as material reminders to them that their place was and presumably always would be at the bottom of the racial hierarchy that characterized the South and the rest of the country. This function is emphasized through the spectacular nature of the ceremonies surrounding each monument. On the left is a photo from the dedication of the Jefferson Davis, Davis Monument in New Orleans in 1907. As you can see, there was a huge crowd and the Confederate flag is draping the monument. For me, this, as an African-American, this image invokes images of lynch mobs. On the right is a photo of a wreath laying ceremony at the Confederate Memorial at Arlington Cemetery in 1922. Each time such ceremonies are performed, it reinforces the racial message, messages conveyed through the monument. The president is typically involved in some way. This particular wreath laying ceremony continued at Arlington every Memorial Day through the Obama years, and I believe it was still being performed performed until COVID uh, kind of changed uh, things in terms of memorial practices and safety and so forth. Um, I don't know if President Biden, what President Biden's plans are for next month when Memorial Day um, comes to pass, um, but I'm assuming um, that he is not going to participate in this ceremony. 
assuming there actually is one. Um, so as I'll show you shortly, even the few monuments that were constructed to honor emancipation reinforce messages of white supremacy and black inferiority. This is still the messages that these statues convey. Second, it, is, it essentially turns a people who, by any objective measure, are historical villains into heroes by reconstructing memories in a way that preserves the status of whiteness as a social identity. Social identity refers to the ways in which a person sees her or himself based on perceived membership in particular groups of which race is one of the most important. Most people have an emotional attachment to their social identity, which provides a sense of belonging to a group. Most, most of, much of what people do involves increasing the status of their social group, which is sometimes accomplished through de decreasing the social status of other groups. Memory is particularly useful to this goal as the memories groups construct from historical events are typically going to be those that cast their social group in the most favorable light. They are also useful in that they enable powerful groups to attribute negative memories to disfavored groups or to marginalize or erase the memories of those groups altogether, particularly if they happen to conflict with the more favorable memories the powerful, the powerful ascribe to themselves. The lost cause narrative embodied by the statues does this work. An important element of this narrative is that the Civil War was fought not over slavery, but over states' rights, and the good white people of the South would have emancipated their slaves eventually they, never act, they were never actually forced to do so through, through defeat in a bloody war. Because of this, whiteness is able to maintain assumptions about its innocence, its moral authority, its currency into the contemporary moment. So th that raises the question, how do they accomplish this? Generally through their locations and their size. These monuments are typically built in prominent public spaces where they could be seen on a daily basis by residents and visitors alike. They are usually quite large in size with the figures of Confederate generals typically standing on large pedestals and sculpted into triumphal postures as if they are watching over those who pass beneath them. This is the Robert E. Lee statue in Richmond, Virginia, which is one of four Confederate statues on Monument Avenue in the city. It stands at 60 feet tall on a pedestal. I included a picture from its dedication in 1890 on the, left, on the, on the right to demonstrate its scale. Next slide, please. This is another statue of Lee in New Orleans. It was also 60 feet tall with its arms crossed and cast in an authoritative pose. As you can see, the entire plot of land on which it is, was located is also named after Lee. This statue was removed in 2015. On the right is the Battle of Liberty Place Monument, also in New Orleans, which had been the subject of removal campaigns for decades. Its history is quite interesting. It is a 35 foot feet tall obelisk commemorating the events that took place in 1874 when an all white organization called the White League massacred black and white members of the city's police force. It was erected in 1891 during the time that the city and state were passing a slew of Jim Crow laws. And in 1932, an inscription was added that described the massacre as a battle that was fought in order to force, quote unquote, the Yankees to recognize white supremacy in the South. It had long served as a rallying point for white supremacist groups. It was temporarily placed in storage in 1989 when its Canal Street location, the city's most prominent spot, underwent cleaning but it didn't resurface until 1993 when it was relocated to a less prominent but historically accurate location between railroad tracks and a parking garage. Finally, in 2017, it was removed from that location after the city council declared it a public nuisance. Third, these monuments also convey messages to black people. If they could speak, they would say, your historical experiences, your history do not matter. They essentially promote a white social identity that is premised on the erasure of black history and social identity. As I mentioned earlier, 
Even the statues foregrounding the African-American experience of the era confine it very narrowly to slavery, which effectively reinforces the idea that Black people were slaves rather than enslaved persons. On the left is the Freedmen's Memorial in Washington, DC, which was actually paid for by Black people and dedicated in 1876, and the Freedmen's Memorial in Boston, which was erected in 1879 and removed in 1920, I'm sorry, in 2020. Both marginalized African Americans' historical experiences and advanced the assumptions of white supremacy. As you can see here, these two monuments present President Lincoln as a godlike savior and represent enslaved persons as supplicants who played no role and thus had no agency in securing their own freedom. There are similar statues in other locations that present a white Union soldier in Lincoln's place. These obscure the historical reality that more than 200,000 black men, some formerly enslaved, some free, fought as Union soldiers in the Civil War. So even the minimal efforts to memorialize the war from an African-American perspective have been highly problematic. Because monuments are presumed to convey the values and identities of the communities in which they are located, these features tend to communicate the message that it is white-centered history that matters and that Black people who live in the community are not really seen to be true members of it. It is no accident that most of the higher profile battles to remove these statues have taken place in cities with majority Black populations. The communities whose spaces these structures occupy should be the ones who decide how those spaces are used to define who they are, including how they see themselves and wish others to see them. It is one of the reasons that efforts to rename Faneuil Hall, named for a prominent slave trader, have gained currency here in Boston in recent years. It is also important to note that many of the people who argue against removal don't even live in the communities in which the statues are located. Finally, in imposing the mythological lost cause narrative about the Civil War, these statues essentially erase the historical context for contemporary inequalities. When people are encouraged to believe that slavery wasn't that bad, they are discouraged from seeing the ways in which its legacy is still with us today. Contemporary police violence in a justice system that refuses to hold police accountable, with Tuesday being a notable rare exception, is one of those legacies. The other inequities we see now in terms of education, income, wealth, housing discrimination, health outcomes, including those connected to COVID, are all legacies of slavery in the Jim Crow system that followed it. So with all of these messages that, that, mon that monuments communicate, we can see why their removal has become part of Black Lives Matter act activism and part of our racial reckoning. Given the meanings attached to them, it's no mystery that activists are making the connections between structures symbolizing racial subjugation and the material reality of police violence. Our contemporary moment is one of racial reckoning and memories of anti-Black violence and the structures that have supported them are an indelible part of that reckoning. As, as such, they have provided a view into the ways in which processes of negotiation intervene in the construction and removal of monuments. African-Americans had no voice during the Jim Crow era that produced these monuments. However, contemporary Black political, social, and economic power have primed the field from a more critical orientation toward dominant historical narratives, including discussions about their impact in the present and future. Recent events that have fostered our racial reckoning, the Charleston church shooting in 2015, the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville in 2017, and the killing of George Floyd in 2020, have all served as catalysts for more productive negotiations about the meaning of Confederate monuments and other structures of white supremacy. 54 monuments were removed between 2015 and 2019. 94 were removed in 2020, according to the Southern Poverty Law Center, with almost all of those taken down after the George Floyd killing. There are around 700 still standing. With regard to Confederate memorials in general, which includes the Confederate flag, names, and other memorial structures, 
there are more than 2,100 still standing. So there's much work to be done. Now, one thing to always remember is that progress is never easy, particularly when you factor in the way change threatens group identity and challenges deeply held ideals. According to NPR, amid movements to remove them between May and October of last year, localities moved to protect 28 Confederate monuments in locations as diverse as Delaware, Florida, and Arizona. The resistance to the removal of these monuments has taken many forms, including legitimate means, such as court and legal actions, and illegitimate means, such as threats of violence. I'd like to speak briefly about a particular mode of resistance that comes across as a compromise measure, but in fact underestimates the work that monuments actually perform. There have been many proposals that deign to leave the monuments intact with the addition of plaques or some other structures providing context, explaining the racist actions and motivations of the honored figures or of the eras that produced the monument. This is inadequate as a solution. People don't always read plaques and to the extent that they do, written text is simply, simply cannot undo or even mitigate the visual and material influences that the monument itself conveys. Contextual explanations would be correctly seen as more of an afterthought with the statue itself as the true representation of the preferred memories on display. If a community wants to convey a message that differs from that of the monument, Removal is the better option, really the only option. Many have also argued that removal represents the erasure of history. However, I want to reiterate that mo monuments do not perform the work of preserving history. They perform the work of venerating the preferred memories of those who are in power at the time. Removal is simply a social action designed to replace one set of memories with another set of memories that is more in line with the desires of the communities in which they are located. In other words, it is an expression of the empowerment of a particular community. And it is important that it is done through official channels because while unofficial acts such as vandalism and extra legal removal have their place, Official removal makes a, much more, makes a much stronger statement about what the community sees as its values and identity. Many of these monuments are located in communities that are now majority African-American or otherwise see themselves as embodying values in conflict with the messages conveyed through Confederate monuments. Each community has the moral right and obligation to decide for itself what structure should be in place as expressions of who it is. I just wanna reiterate that point. This has been done with monuments highlighting black experiences of the era. I'll show you some notable examples. Pictured here is the Spirit of Freedom, which is part of the African-American Civil War Museum in Washington, DC. The statue foregrounds the experiences of the black men who fought in the Union Army as United States colored troops during the Civil War. On the right is the back of the statue, which depicts a black family highlighting the roles of women. Both sides emphasize African American agency in securing their own emancipation and serves as a counter narrative to racist stereotypes about black passivity during slavery and dysfunction in the past and present. On the left is the Robert Gould Shaw Monument on Boston Common, which depicts the 54th Massachusetts. Some of you may be familiar with this black regiment from the 1989 film Glory. Now some might find this rendering somewhat problematic as it emphasizes um, uh, Shaw, who, a white man, who is sculpted on his horse above the black soldiers. However, the soldiers are not depicted in a submissive posture as was the case in the other monuments I just showed you. And historically, it was not unusual to see the commander and his soldiers assuming these positions. On the right is the monument to enslaved laborers at the University of Virginia, which was dedicated last year. It serves to demystify the aura surrounding President Thomas Jefferson and counter the impact of the Robert E. Lee statue in the city, which will likely be dismantled in the very near future. 
I will now turn to a discussion of the ways in which movements to remove racist monuments have extended well beyond Confederate memorials. Indeed, movements to tear down monuments of subjugation have taken place throughout the US and all over the world as citizens of countries still grappling with the legacies of imperialism and colonialism have enacted campaigns of removal as part of, part of broader programs of social reform. This is a statue of Christopher Columbus that was erected at the Minnesota State Capitol in 1931. It was pulled from its pedestal by American Indian movement protesters in June of 2020 in the wake of the killing of George Floyd. On the left here is a statue of George Milligan, a prominent 18th century slave trader. It was erected at the West India docks in London in 1813 and was vandalized and removed in June of 2020 by anti-racism protesters. On the right is the statue erected in Bristol in 1895 of Edward Colston, a 17th century British slave trader. It was toppled, defaced, and tossed into Bristol Harbor by Black Lives Matter, Lives Matter protesters in June of 2020. These actions were part of a much longer history of removal that encompasses former colonial subject states. Statues of Cecil Rhodes were taken down in Zimbabwe in 1980, shortly after it gained its independence, while another statue of Rhodes was dismantled in South Africa in 2015. As is the case in the US, these actions have forced a reckoning with these histories of conquest, exploitation, and subjugation, and a reevaluation of the messages embedded in the structures that have glorified them. They also represent a new way in which the relationship between memory and negotiation manifests in the 21st century, the use of reckonings over memorial structures to address the material legacies of the histories they glorify and to propose reparative measures. For example, the removal of the Rhodes statue in South Africa was accompanied by demands that a college education be free and accessible to all, and that school curricula be decolonized. Our current moment suggests that these efforts will continue into the foreseeable future. I say this not just in terms of responding to the Black Lives Matter movement, but also in terms of the threats to democratic governance posed by white supremacy in the post-Trump era. I'll conclude with the return to the story with which I started, that of the travails of the Jefferson Davis chair. The chair ultimately was found on April 8th on a street in New Orleans after someone sent the GPS coordinates of its location to the UDC. It was found intact and returned to the group, which says it will return it to its original spot with some sort of security apparatus in the future. While the fact that these statues now need such measures to be taken is a welcome development, this suggests that there is still much more work to do. And all of us in attending this presentation are in our own way engaged in that kind of work. So I'll go ahead and end um, with that proclamation. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, and if anyone would like to submit questions, um, please feel free to do so in the chat box. Give folks a few minutes to type in their questions. <laughs> Any questions from folks? <clears throat> oh, here we go. All right. Um, so on George's Island in Boston Harbor, there used to be a small monument stone listing um, the names of 12 Confederate prisoners of war. That's 
I guess <laughs> not a question. I'm sorry, but that is, yeah, that's very interesting. I don't know if that's still there. Um. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, yeah, I definitely agree with that. And I actually think that's really interesting that uh, Confederate prisoners of war would be honored here in Boston. Uh, that, um, you know, the sentiment behind that um, honorific would seem to be in conflict with the, uh, with the, um, the perception of Boston as an, as an, you know, as a hyper progressive city, and certainly in conflict with its abolitionist history. Um, so I find that fascinating. I actually didn't know about it either. I'm glad you brought it up because that's the potential, that's a potential uh, new, uh, uh, research uh, study and paper for me. <laughs> Good. Well, we'll have to connect you with Marguerite then. <laughs> yeah. um, so history is always a learning platform. Any ideas on ways to use the removed statues for teaching and learning? Um, well, there's always been talk about putting them in a museum. And I'm not sure exactly how serious um, such suggestions ultimately are, because as you can see, one of the things that we talked about was the sheer scale of these monuments, right? Some of them are 60 feet high. Um, just in practical terms, they're just, a lot of them just aren't gonna fit um, in museums. So that's not, that's not even possible in many cases. Um, so, um, you know, to the extent that some of the, some of the smaller ones do uh, tend to fit in museums, um, they could possibly serve an educational purpose there um, because part of what, of the work that museums do is to educate the public. Um, so they could serve that function there. Um, there are other spaces that they could um, occupy that would also help advance an educational function, um, such as the, you know, the headquarters of the, of the UDC would certainly be one place. I mean, if the UDC is in the business of, of educating young children about their interpretations of history, then why not have those monuments located there where they can, ser where they can serve that function? Uh, the same thing with the Sons of Confederate Veterans, um, another Confederate, um, neo-Confederate group um, that um, has, was prolific in um, erecting Confederate monuments, not quite as prolific as the UDC, but prolific nonetheless. And they typically, um, they along with the UDC typically lead the charge against removal, removing Confederate monuments. Why not locate some of these structures at their headquarters um, and in some of their buildings and on their property where they can also serve the function of educating um, children about their interpretation of Civil War history. So that's, those are probably the three places I would suggest relocating Confederate monuments is at the UDC, uh, the, Sons of Con the SCV, Sons of Confederate Veterans um, properties, and in museums um, uh, to the extent that, that the uh, monuments are small enough to accommodate um, putting a, uh, put, uh, being placed in a museum. Um, on public, lands to me is, is, is a non-starter um, because public locations belong to everyone. Um, they are, and again, it's the communities um, that have, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that make up those public spaces that should decide where those statues are going to be. And if they decide they don't want a, a statue of Jefferson Davis there, um, then they really serve no purpose there. They, I mean, they're, they're the purposes in, of their location in public spaces is not educational, at least not to the extent, not to the, not in the way that advocates um, for keeping them up claim that they are. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, so another question, um, so NASCAR has um, banned the display of the Confederate flag at their events. Um, and this ban has, um, as far as we know, been relatively successful. Do you know of any other um, similarly successful bans? Do you have any thoughts on that? Um. Let's see. Well, I think one of the reasons NASCAR was so was so successful, exceptionally successful, was because it, it's a particular culture in which you would not expect um, there to be any um, sentiment toward removing the flag. Um, so I can name many other spaces in which the Confederate flag has been removed. Um, certainly, in terms of state governments, the removal in South Carolina a few years ago was 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 quite telling, as was the removal from the uh, the flag of Mississippi 
um, because both in both cases, because those are locations in which you never expected them to actually be removed. Um, in other situations, um, the, the ones that are most um, well known, um, aside from those uh, three examples, are typically in, in spaces where there was so, somewhat of an expectation that they would actually be removed. Um, so right offhand, I can't think of any that um, would, uh, you know, where, you know, where it would be a highly unusual um, act to actually remove them. I mean, I, if I thought a little bit about it um, for a while, I might be able to come up with one or two. Um, but offhand, it's it's very difficult simply because there's so many spaces that they're being removed from where there's somewhat of an expectation that that was going to actually happen. Makes sense. Great. Um, so this is a little bit of a follow up question um, to the monuments being moved into museums. If the sculptures that were able to fit were to put in a museum with the second sculpture next to it, um, as they are reinterpreted as like a true more of a truthful statue, what are your thoughts on that? That I think I think there is some room for that simply because, uh, in, as I said earlier, when you've got a public monument and there's a there's a potential there's potentially a plaque that that um, seeks to explain the context for it and to you know and to discuss the racism embedded in it. Most passersby are simply not going to read uh, the plaques, right? And certainly the people who live in the community are not going to read it, um, and so forth. In a museum, there is much more of an expectation that people do read uh, the placards that explain the exhibits. So um, in that case, I do think uh, there is some room to argue that a plaque would be useful um, as a way of explaining the monument itself and maybe a counter monument that might be placed next to it because the, of the higher expectations in terms of visitors to a museum informing themselves about what they're actually watching versus a, some, a monument that's out in public somewhere. That makes sense. Um, all right, so do you think that the South had to frame the perception of the Civil War as a war of Northern aggression or states rights instead of about the slave based economy because many of the foot soldiers weren't slave owners and had to be won over um, to support the cause? Uh, no, I, I don't think that's the case at all because all of this revision uh, happened after the, the war. So the, you know, the, those who actually participated in it didn't need uh, that kind of, of um, of, um, of um, urging to actually participate in it. And one thing that you always want to keep in mind, and this is an art, whenever I talk to people um, about, you know, which has, it's actually been a while, especially since I moved here to Boston, but certainly when I was living in Atlanta, uh, there were more opportunities to talk about this, um, this, this work with people who are outside of the academic community. One of the questions you almost always get is, um, well, you know, most soldiers were just doing a job. You know, they weren't slave owners. They didn't, they didn't really have any real stakes in the Civil War. So uh, what do you, you know, what are you to make of their participation? And the response is always um, and should always be, well, they didn't necessarily have, there were no material benefits that accrued to them because they weren't slave owners. However, slavery was an entire society wide social system. So every white person, even those who did not own slaves benefited from it in some way even if it was only psychic benefits of knowing that there was some group on the social hierarchy that would always be lower than you, right? So, um, you know, and that's just the psychic benefits. There, you know, there may have been some material benefits in the form of, you know, everyday white laborers not having to compete with um, cheaper black labor if African Americans were freed, right? So there were, you know, there were some material benefits there, though certainly not at the scale uh, that slave owners had to benefit from. So um, that would be, uh, you know, I would, to address that particular question, that's the, um, that's the, the, the possibility that I would bring up is that it was an entire social system that every white person benefited from whether or not they actually owned slaves. And that has everything to do with um, the way the war is memorialized immediately after it ended um, throughout the 20th century and into the 21st century. And, you know, and that's obvious just from the fact that you see um, a lot of these white supremacist groups, you know, flying Confederate flags now. I mean, the Capitol insurrection that occurred um, in January, um, one of the most 
prominent pictures from it was of someone carrying a Confederate flag into the Capitol building, right? So, um, you know, whether or not your ancestors actually owned slaves is, you know, is not, uh, is, is, is not as relevant as, as a lot of people think it is. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, and then our last question. Um, do you think that higher education um, has played a significant enough role in teaching about these issues, as well as providing leadership like yours and advocating for social justice change? I think it has. Um, but I, at the same time, I also think that more education um, can be uh, can actually come from um, having um, public voices talk about these things. And that's one way in which, um, you know, the whole Capitol insurrection with the Confederate flag flying, the massacre at the Charleston church in 2015, the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville in 2017, um, and all, you know, George Floyd, that where there is some benefit that comes from these things is, is it tends to spur national discussions about, um, about, you know, the partiality or the partisan nature of historical narratives and how we choose to remember. And they do so in ways that formal education is inadequate to do so. And this is one of the things that I talk about with my students is um, there's a, you know, the media are, um, are, are significantly responsible for this. There is the perception that more people in the US are educated um, in terms of college education than, are, than actually are. I think the statistic now is about 27% uh, percent of the population in the US actually has a four-year degree. So most people are not going to be um, exposed to the kind of critical um, um, historical education that would come about that would allow them to speak um, um, to speak about these things. And even among that 27%, most of them don't get, are not necessarily going to get an education in, um, in, in, in this type of history. I know I didn't, uh, you know, my undergraduate major was business. I didn't get any kind of education in this. And I certainly did not get it in, in K through 12 education. And I'm in fact, growing up in Virginia, my K through 12 education taught me uh, that black people were slaves. And that was pretty much um, the extent of black people's participation um, in the civil war. I knew nothing about black soldiers, union soldiers until the film Glory came out. Um, we were also taught in K through 12 education that reconstruction was a bad thing. Um, and that black people basically had no history other than being slaves and Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks and that's it, right? So the K through 12 education people get in terms of um, Civil War history and African-American history to say it's inadequate would be an understatement. Um, so, you know, and even in college, you're not necessarily going to get that history. Um, so, um, and I've gotten most of my historical knowledge just from, you know, researching my dissertation when I was in graduate school and writing my book. So even well, in, well into adulthood, I didn't get this. So um, I would say greater education does work to the extent that it, it fosters um, a type of the type of critical thinking uh, that might cause people to question um, dominant historical narratives. But when it comes specifically to civil war history, people are more likely to get that from public voices and leadership who do talk about these things. And increasingly from film, right? We've seen a lot of films uh, that purport to uh, discuss African-American experiences of the era and that are openly critical of um, other you know, films of the past like Gone with the Wind and um, you know, Birth of a Nation, all of those. So um, I guess the, that was a long answer, but I guess to sum it up, the short answer is, uh, yes and no. <laughs> yes, still work to be done for sure. Yes. Great. Well, thank you so much, Professor Davis, for being with us today. I know that was a wonderful presentation. I know everyone definitely enjoyed it um, and learned a lot from it. So I want just again, thank you so much for taking your time to speak with us today. You are very welcome. Great. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Um, and hopefully I'll see some of you next week for our next NU at Noon session.